this occurred, they were living at 144B Pinckney Street, which again is a street just off Center Street, just several blocks from the courthouse. Uh, they lived in a mobile home, uh, which was behind another mobile home right off the street. Um, on um, this particular day, we believe, well, let me, let me say this too. This is a case for trial scheduled to begin this coming Monday. Um, witnesses are subpoenaed, including several doctors from Columbia who treated Ms. Jordan. It's, it's ready to go. In, in, in a trial posture, this is what the state would be able to prove by those witnesses, as I understand. Um, we believe the event began about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, a young lady uh, who was a witness in the case was riding on Pinckney Street, and uh, somebody who knew Mr. Nichols and had known him for some period of time uh, did not know Ms. Jordan, but knew, did not personally know her, but had seen the young lady she's, she's fixing to, I'm fixing to describe for you with Mr. Nichols walking up and down the street for some period of time. So she didn't know who Brittany was, but she knew that that young girl had been hanging out with Mr. Nichols. Um, she rode by uh, an area on Pinckney Street and basically saw what she believed to be an assault occurring between who she identified as Mr. Nichols and this pregnant female that she had seen him walking with on previous occasions. Um, she got on her cell phone, called the police, uh, continued to watch what was going on between the two people, she reported that Mr. Nichols was over the young lady who was on the ground and that, that a physical assault was actually in progress. Um, at, at some point, the young lady got up. Um, she said Mr. Nichols grabbed her by the arm and they started walking back toward what we believe to be the home on Pinckney Street. Uh, police were dispatched. The witness left the area before police got there. They never made contact with her, but by the time the police got there, uh, there was nobody in the area that they could identify with this event that had been reported. The witness did report that the man was wearing a red shirt, that Nichols was wearing a red shirt, and that uh, the young lady was wearing a brown coat, which is consistent with evidence discovered later when this event was actually uncovered by the police. So it, it rocked on that way. Uh, police heard nothing else until about 1.30 in the afternoon, got another 911 call from a young lady who was Mr. Nick, Mr. Nichols' cousin, who lived just across the way from where Mr. Nichols and Ms. Jordan lived. That cousin reported to the police that, that Brittany had been assaulted and was in a bad condition and needed help. So police responded, Chester City Police responded, uh, went to the house, found uh, the cousin who reported it, found Mr. Nichols who was present in the house, and found Brittany Jordan, the victim in the case, who was on a bed uh, and obviously had been assaulted, was bleeding profusely, uh, was in very bad condition uh, based on initial assessments there at the scene. Um, Brittany was, Mr. Nichols was taken into custody. Um, Brittany was transported 
to some location, I guess maybe the Chester Hospital, but was airlifted to Palmetto Health, Richland, where she was treated uh, for a significant period of time. And I'm going to get into that more later during this proceeding. But uh, Brittany, at the time, was just at 30 weeks pregnant with a child. And uh, when she was taken in to the emergency room at Palmetto Health, Richland, um, it was determined that she had several different types of injuries. Um, it was pretty obvious initially that she had multiple stab wounds to her face and head and neck. Um, the concern was for the baby. Um, it was determined uh, after some period of time of treatment there at the hospital that there were no fetal heart sounds for the baby. And um, she was so far along that um, they determined they needed to do something fairly quickly. Um, there was no immediate rush to do a C-section, but that was the plan and then Brittany got into a hypotensive state and um, started having some tachy tachycardia problems with her heart. So they did an emergency C-section and delivered the baby, which uh, was a male child and which was deceased. And I'll um, get into a little bit more detail about that in a minute too. Um, well, I will go ahead and get into that now. Um, it was determined uh, based on the doctor who did the, did the emergency C-section that um, there was a what's de described as a about a 60% placental abruption, which means separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. And the placenta is what delivers blood and oxygen to the baby, and that separation deprived the baby of blood and oxygen, and as a result of that, the baby died. Uh, Brittany had been receiving pre prenatal care from a doctor over in Lancaster. Had, um, everything had been progressing well with her pregnancy. Her last visit, I think, I remember from the note, was on April 12th, which was a little over a week before this event occurred. And on that visit, the baby was fine, the exam was fine, everything was normal. Uh, Brittany also told me that on the day this event occurred, she felt the baby move just prior to the stabbing event that occurred um, at the house, which I'm going to get into more detail about later also. Um, an autopsy was done, done of the baby. Uh, the autopsy revealed um, that the baby was, um, again, um, right at 30 weeks. It was described as a well-developed, viable male fetus. There was no obvious injury to the baby himself. Uh, there was no congenital abnormality or evidence of any natural disease that would have contributed to the baby's death. Um, and the uh, autopsy result was that the uh, death of the baby was intrauterine fetal demise based on placental abruption as the result of maternal trauma. Now, um, let me get back to Say another way, blood couldn't flow. That's right. Baby basically was suffocated from not having blood and oxygen. Your Honor, I'm, I interviewed Brittany. Brittany was talked to by police in the hospital, was later interviewed, uh, gave a written statement, uh, a videotaped statement at the hospital and a written statement, and I interviewed her myself. Trial. And, and let me just give you a little bit of the detail of what she tells me occurred. Uh, what she would testify occurred between the two of them. Um, the day this event occurred, early in the morning, uh, she said Mr. Nichols had been out um, all night, and that apparently was a problem. Um, on a recurring basis, and she basically concluded she had had enough. She has an aunt, um, Aunt Deb, who lives on Mobley Street in Chester, and Brittany just basically apparently had decided she's going to break camp. She wasn't going to stay there anymore. She was tired of it. She packed a bag, walked out of the house after Mr. Nichols came home. He was outside working on his bicycle. She started walking off down the street, actually coming this way toward the courthouse. Um, he followed her on the bicycle, pulled up beside her, got off the bike, uh, pushed her by the head to the ground. She was down on the ground. He was pushing on her head. Uh, she got herself up. Um, and um, he, according to her, uh, he said, if you don't come home, I got, if you don't come here, I got something for you. He grabbed her by the arm and pulled her toward the house. Um, and they ended up walking down the street to get back to the house. Uh, she says, once at the house, um, of course, she was crying and upset. And you'll meet her in a little bit. Um, they went inside. Um, he was leaning on the counter. Uh, she was sitting in a chair. Um, she was still crying. He said, if you don't stop crying, I got something for you. And according to her, he grabbed a knife out of the kitchen and started jabbing at her head with the knife. And um, she fell to the floor. Uh, he covered her up with a couple of blankets. Um, she was uh, immediately felt the sense of not being able to move. Um, she, on her right side, she couldn't move her arms. She couldn't move her legs. She couldn't move enough to get the blankets off of herself. Um, Nichols um, left 
and um, came back a short time later and uh, she was uh, begging him to get her some help. Um, when he came back, she was asking again for help and he took the blankets off of her and she said he grabbed her by the arm and the leg and threw her in the bed. And um, he left again and apparently went next door to where his cousin was and according to the cousin, told the cousin, you better come over here and check on Brittany. So the cousin goes across, finds Brittany in the bed in the condition she was in. The cousin goes back to her house and gets her cell phone and then calls police. And, and that call was like 1.30 in the afternoon. So again, we believe these events started about 8.30. The worst of it probably occurred early in the morning and it wasn't discovered until Mr. Nichols finally went somewhere to get Brittany some help about 1.30. Um, I think factually that's enough for me to tell you at this point there will be other comments I will make later. <coughs> and that is the evidence that the state would present in a summarized form at trial next week with the witnesses who've been subpoenaed. Thank you. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my representation and my investigation of the matter, and then I want to tell you about our view of the facts and what probably happened here. As I said, I was appointed shortly after the arrest. I, I interviewed Mr. Nichols. I talked to him. From the very beginning, he told me that he had no memory of this incident. Uh, he didn't remember anything happening like this. So, you know, what I did was um, our office, the public defender's office, retained the services of a private investigator firm. Uh, Pete Skidmore and Associates, that's Pete Jr. here, has helped me in this case. His father's helped me as well. Uh, they you know, do good work throughout this state. We basically took this case and kind of reinvestigated it from, from, from the beginning. Uh, not criticizing anything the police department did, but from our perspective, when a client says he doesn't remember what happened, we're going to look into it. And we ran this thing to ground, and we talked to witnesses. We've spoken, and I say we, a uh, client yep. investigator, also spoken to the victim in this case, spoken to numerous witnesses in this matter. And, and unfortunately for Mr. Nichols, is the more we investigated, there was really nothing to suggest that these accusations are not true. Um, it, it, it all, every, we could not find any evidence in our investigation indicating anyone else committed this crime. So, the question then becomes, well, why did it happen? And, and I think to explain that, you kind of have to go back a little bit. Sometimes people, you know, whenever I start talking about people's childhood, they, um, you know, they think we're making excuses. But the truth of it is, you know, we're a product of, I suppose I say we're a product of all that we have met. And I'm part of all that I, that I have met. The line. And I think that's true. And so you have to kind of look at, you know, where did Eris Nichols come from? How did he get to this point in his life? His mother is a lady named Bessie Dye. That's Miss Dye right back there. Raise your hand, Miss Dye. Um, that's his aunt, Azalee Nichols, right there next to her. Raise your hand. I'm going to let both of them say a word or two to you in a minute. Um, and I certainly mean no disrespect to his mother at all, but I, I think it's fair to point out that when this young man was a child, he um, was raised in very, very difficult circumstances, both as to poverty, both as to involvement with the DSS system. Um, Linda Lee, who was, a, was his DSS caseworker at one time, she'll tell you, she's here, I'd ask you to hear from her in a few minutes about her involvement with his family and kind of the difficult circumstances that they came up in. Um, Rick Wessinger from DJJ is here. Rick has known um, Mr. Nichols a long time too, longer than I have, even anybody else. I think his IQ is a, is very low. I don't think he qualifies to be intellectually disabled, um, but I think he has a functional IQ on the very low side of normal. And, and I think what happens is when you get somebody with raised in extreme poverty, with uh, no, there's no male role models, father really very involved, not involved much in his life at all, uh, very difficult home situation. I'll let the DSS worker tell you a little bit about that. And, um, and then you add in the substance abuse, you know, there's trouble waiting to happen. And what happened is he became a substance abuse user, a substance abuser, excuse me, and he, and he had difficulty, including at one point a, a, a stretch in prison. But I, the, the tragedy of this case, but it's too tragic, obviously what happened to the victim in this case is horrible, and, and you know, nothing can, I can say to, to ease that. But, so that's a tragedy. But the other tragedy and the sort of overarching thing from my perspective is 
Everybody I talked to says that Harris had been doing so much better up until this happened. Um, Reverend Morris tells me that he had been going to church regularly. He was a regular at their Tuesday Bible study. He showed up every Sunday. He um, was hired as the custodian for the church to try to give him, the church was trying to work with him and try to help him. And I honestly believe that he had not used drugs for at least that period of time. He had gotten away from those demons. Now, was his life perfect? No. You'll hear, and I don't know how much of this really matters, but you know, DSS was involved with he and the victim. They both have issues. There, there were plenty of problems. But he was not, he was away from the worst demons that he faced. And I think what happened, best we can conclude, because we can't find any other evidence or explanation for it, is that um, I think that the, the day this happened or the night before, I think he fell, he slipped and succumbed to his demons again. I think he got into some drugs, probably powdery, it's not powdered cocaine, crack cocaine. He used it and I think he lost all self-control. Um, that's not an excuse, as the court knows, voluntary intoxication is not a defense, and I've talked about that. But I do think it's an explanation for why someone who had been doing so much better for a while did this.